Hello friends and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast, the show that inspires you to change and live a more exciting life. My name is Ismail and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or topic that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life individually and collectively. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In today's episode, I have the great joy to share a conversation that I had with Olivia, who used to be the lab manager at the Center of Human Sleep Science at UC Berkeley, and who is an expert on sleep, amongst other things. In this episode, we talk about how much sleep is enough and what good sleep hygiene means. You will learn about techniques to sleep and rest better as well. You will understand sleep rebound and why you do not want to make it a habit. And you will get a better understanding of how interconnected sleep, cognitive and also emotional capabilities are. You will hear about techniques that you can personally use to improve your sleep and well-being. We talk about career changes, prestigious universities, exploring and exploiting ideas, and what role making an impact with one's career can have. And with that, Olivia, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is how do you feel and what is on your mind? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think what's on my mind going into this week is um, some potential uh, salary negotiations that I might be coming up on. Um, So that's been something I've been thinking a lot about listening to a couple of podcasts um, about how to walk into that room with some confidence. Okay, I'm sure you will. And thank you very much for sharing that that openly. And in fact, before we go into today's conversation, I would like to give a little context for our audience. And that is Olivia, I started contacting you actually quite a while ago, because you are still a great expert on sleep and sleep deprivation. And this is for sure a topic that we're going to talk about today. And in the meantime, there has actually been quite a career pivot, I want to call it, on my end. And this is another topic that I'm always very interested about. Why do people change their career or change at least their focus of their career? And that much may be sad that there was actually quite some time that we talked to each other online via mail before actually having this conversation. So I'm really delighted that we're here today. Thank you. Me as well. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And Olivia, maybe we start with one of your expertise topics, in fact, and that would be sleep and sleep deprivation. And you're calling in from California. It's 9 a.m. And maybe you can tell us how much do you usually sleep? I usually aim for a solid seven to eight hours, if not eight and a half hours. I do care a lot about my sleep hygiene, so I really do try to make the space um, so that I get enough sleep um, so that I can feel good going about my day. If I get less than six hours, I totally just feel a little wonky. And similarly, if I am sleeping nine and a half, ten hours, I also feel a little bit wonky. Um, I do think that that is an individual thing. So some people will feel better um, if they go around six hours. I don't know if I would recommend it, but, and then some people will feel better if they have that nine hours. Um, So it kind of just depends on the person. It's not a uniform thing necessarily. It's not a uniform thing. And I hear that you can sleep too little and that you can also sleep too much. And what you just mentioned, I find very interesting is what you called sleep hygiene. What do you understand that to be? 
similarly to how you might think about like dental hygiene, for example, uh, what are the pieces that go into that? So that's going to include some of the daily things like brushing your teeth, hopefully flossing your teeth. Uh, there's the more um, uh, infrequent activities such as going to a dentist um, or doing different kinds of checkups. So if you apply that to sleep, um, there are the daily things that I think really help you set yourself up for success um, in terms of having good quality sleep that is includes taking care of your sleep environment, um, having a good time to wind down, um, as you go getting ready for bed, you know, ideally you're not just like going from absorbing a ton of content on social media and like scrolling through things to immediately trying to have your brain quiet itself. So ideally there's a little bit of a wind down time. Um, I mentioned the environment. Um, and I think those with those two things, you can make a lot of small, uh, low effort improvements to your sleep quality. I found that to be my experience. No, absolutely. And you talk about the sleep environment. Is that a dark room, a quiet room, or what is a good sleep environment? Supposingly, this also depends on the individual, but what is a good sleep environment for you? Definitely. Um, a good sleep environment for me are, are exactly those things that you mentioned. So a dark room, um, I have actually at different points used um, dark curtains so that like even as the sun, like I, I noticed that I'm very um, affected by the amount of light coming into my room, which will wake me up a little bit earlier than I would prefer. So I have used dark curtains, perhaps in the summer. Um, a quiet room is definitely preferable. Um, I've used earplugs if I'm sleeping somewhere that's super noisy, um, which I've lived both in the city and more in the suburbs and more in the country. So um, that is definitely subject to change. Uh, another one that people don't often think about right away is a cool room. So ideally, your room is about 68 degrees um, Fahrenheit, which I think in um, Celsius is about 23. Um, and so having a cool room, it has been is really important as well so that your brain can cool down. Yeah. Okay. I understood. It sounds very interesting. And is that temperature something rather universal or is there people who sleep much better at 18 degrees? And is there people who would sleep much better at 28, 27 degrees Celsius, which out of my head, I don't know how much that would be in Fahrenheit, but I think you get the idea. So you'll see these individual differences. Um, as we we're talking about for sleep duration. So I assume that someone that's grown up like maybe around the tropics uh, and is used to like very, very warm temperatures is going to have a hard time falling asleep if it's much colder than they are used to. Um, and someone that's uh, growing up like in the north um, is going to have a hard time falling asleep if it's a bit warmer, perhaps. So there's always like individual, slight individual differences um, and what people are familiar with. A big thing in terms of the sleep environment is familiarity. So if you've ever experienced, um, as I'm sure you have, like being a traveler, the first couple of nights you're in a new place, it might be a little bit more challenging or you might wake up a few more times. And it's because part of your brain is still kind of, some of your sensory brain is still kind of awake, making sure that the, your new environment is safe uh, for you to sleep in. Because of course, uh, you're very vulnerable as a sleeping agent um, to the external world. Talking a little bit about the brain, again, something that I picked up during an earlier comment of yours is that you said, okay, we have some wind down time and that we preferably do not consume a whole lot of content. And I think all of us kind of know that at least an hour, maybe even two, you don't look at a device anymore. And I would be interested if there is any studies, is that due to the fact of the content or is that due to looking at a device? Meaning, is it that your brain is active thinking about whatever you are consuming, even though it might be dull social media, or is it looking at a device and the screen? I don't know if you differentiate between the two. Absolutely. And it's both. It's definitely both. There are quite a few studies looking at the effect of just the bright light. Um, and it doesn't need to be social media. I, I read a study that was uh, where people were using an iPad to read. And so they were just reading, but they were finding significant effects on um, how long it took someone to go to sleep um, and how awake they felt the next day even. So there's definitely the actual, just the physical 
light, difference of light, um, that close to your face typically, um, that late at night when your brain is trying to secrete melatonin, but that kind of light prevents melatonin from being secreted. Um, and then as for content, what they talk a lot about is, is salience. And so if something's very engaging um, or it's stimulating your brain a lot, that's definitely not going to help you wind down for a restful night of sleep, especially if you're watching something, um, you know, that, that something that's stressful, such as like the news or social media um, that might be very stressful in going to bed. Um, so it's definitely both. Question. And I don't know if you have an assumption or even an answer based on a study there. And I would be interested if you have negative thoughts or stuff that keeps you very busy. Let's just say, I think all of us have such faces in our life. If it can help to write them down in a journal before you go to bed or make a voice recording or something basically to put those ideas and thoughts somewhere else than taking them into the night. I don't know if that makes sense. And if you have, in fact, an answer to that. I have definitely come across that as a tip in terms of uh, some people have a lot, have a um, quite a bit of difficulty falling asleep. Um, I myself am able to fall asleep usually pretty quickly. I'm one of the lucky ones there. But um, for people that are maybe feeling anxious before going to sleep, I have heard that writing something down, writing a, uh, making a voice note, as you mentioned, are good tips to just get that thought outside of you. That's um, so then you can think about it tomorrow, but at least it's written down. Um, and I find that I've heard that that has helped people. Okay, thank you very much. I'm also one of the lucky ones, usually, at least even at new places, I fall asleep in no time. But I think there's a lot of people who have much more difficulties falling asleep. So thank you very much on those comments on the sleep environment and also the wind down time. Um, I think one more thing in terms of sleep hygiene, that's been, I think, the most crucial for me is consistency trying to be consistent in when you're going to bed and when you're waking up um, on the weekends it kind of doesn't matter when I fall asleep I will usually wake up between 7 30 and 8 30 um, during the week I typically wake up around 7 30 so that's not perfect but just trying to be as consistent as possible helps your body figure out okay when should I start sending out these hormones that are going to initiate the process of sleep for you um, yeah, I think that's been really crucial. And, and um, you know, so not going to bed at 11 p.m. one night and then 4 a.m. the next night and then, t you know, 8 p.m. the night the next night um, being more consistent with your schedule is, is very helpful for your body to set up those circadian rhythms. OK, and try to have kind of a natural rhythm. And let's just maybe take an example. And I don't want to invade anyone's sleep rhythm here. But I hear you say that if during the week due to work or due to commuting or due to something, you wake up at, let's say, 6 a.m., 7 a.m. And then during the weekends, because you have to gain back or because you like to sleep or because you have a different chronotype, you sleep until 11 a.m. or even noon, that this usually would not be the very best for your brain and for your sleep rhythm overall. Is that a fair assumption? It is. Um, that's what they call sleep rebound. So you're experiencing some kind of deprivation uh, during the week if you're going to bed um, and, and you're only getting six hours of sleep before you have to wake up. So on the weekend, you overcompensate for the sleep that you've lost during the week. However, kind of on that point of consistency, um, it's a little bit more challenging for your body to catch up to when it should be initiating sleep. Um, so there definitely is there are there is some research to back up that assumption. Okay, so sleep rebound, as you call it, would be one sign, at least I would understand it of sleep deprivation. Is there other or are there other signs that come to mind that an individual listening can understand, okay, maybe my sleep is not the way it should be, or I should change something about my sleeping rhythm, something that comes to mind? Definitely. I think one of the biggest things is just trying to observe how you feel. Um, in the first couple of hours, of course, there is that 
first 30 minutes right after you wake up where you're not going to feel incredibly alert. That's what you call sleep inertia, uh, which is kind of that groggy state that you experience in the first, yeah, usually about 30 minutes of waking up. But then after that, once you've um, had some water, once you've kind of gotten up for the day, hopefully you should be feeling okay um, and not immediately ready to take a nap. So if you're feeling excessively tired immediately, that's a good sign. Um, that maybe there's something in your sleep routine that you can try to address. Um, and that can also include um, what you might eat before you go to sleep. If you're, um, you know, any kind of substances that you consume right before, right before sleep, because we know that alcohol and um, marijuana also, and cannabis also affect um, sleep, um, especially that REM sleep that you experience in the second half of the night. Okay, thank you. There's a couple of follow-up questions. Let's just see if we can go through them. You said waking up and drinking some water in the morning to basically start your day. If you want, you can, of course, talk us through your morning routine if there is such a thing. But it, what is your after-sleep routine? So how do you wake up? Is it the alarm and you jump out of bed straight away and you start the day? Or how does it look in the morning for yourself? I'll give you an idealized version. Um, I personally have sometimes a, a, quite a bit of difficulty getting myself out of bed once I've woken up. I'll sometimes stay in bed for 20 to 30 minutes, which is not ideal. But in an ideal world, there's a couple of things that I would do within the first um, 60 minutes of being awake. One of those things is getting bright, natural light. So going and looking out a window while I drink my coffee, um, drinking water. Um, because, you know, for those eight hours, we're dehydrated, we, we can be dehydrated. The next thing would be a little bit of exercise. Yeah, I think those are a couple of things that are definitely that that help me feel more awake. Um, and something else that research has found has is like cold water, like washing your face a little bit, that often can help with something like alertness. Um, if you're feeling a little bit groggy in the morning. Okay, so light water drinking, then some kind of exercise or movement, and then again, water, cold exposure, I might just call it. Okay, thank you very much for depicting this ideal world. And you also talked about food and food before going to bed. We said, okay, it's, it might not be the best idea to look at your device or consume much of content for the last two hours before going to bed. How is that with food how much time before you go to bed do you try not to eat or even consume any other substances which we may talk about a little bit i try to have my like big evening meal about two to three hours before i go to bed i don't want that sitting in my stomach as i'm laying down i'm um, doing very little <laughs> um so I try to have that big meal about two to three hours before bed. I may have like an additional snack or something later in the night. Uh, things I try to typically stay away from right before sleep is anything kind of spicy. Um, I love spicy foods um, and I love spicy snacks, but I find that I don't love those things right before sleep and right before um, an intensive workout. So I think that's just something I try to keep in mind. And is that personal preference or is there also some data, let's say, to back up that spicy food before going to bed keeps your body, your digestion more busy than other types of food or snacks? I believe there is some research behind that. I'm not familiar with it um, right now. And I think I've heard it like also anecdotally in terms of, um, you know, maybe something also very like super fatty, I wouldn't have right before bed. Um, maybe that's my experience in the field giving me a little bit of an instinct on that one. But yeah, I think there's probably something there, but I can't think of it right now. We talked about sleep deprivation and waking up. And again, a thought that came across is sometimes and I personally speak here, it's I sleep I guess also something between seven and a half, eight hours, I try at least to sleep and that looked differently a couple of years ago. But sometimes I have the feeling that I wake up and I feel super well, but if I do fall asleep for whichever reason again, and I sleep as little as 15, 20, 30 minutes, like a morning nap or so, and I wake up 
second time, I feel much worse. And you also talked about sleeping too much. Could you tell me what is, or could you give an assumption what is happening there if you, yeah, in fact, fall asleep again on the weekends or for whichever other reason? I think that probably has to do with a couple of things. First of which is that idea of consistency. Um, I think if you're waking up mid REM cycle uh, because of, a, of an alarm, perhaps. So you're just kind of being abruptly taken out of that state and then you fall back asleep. You're, you know, there's a, there's conflicting things going on where it's like you're trying to stay awake perhaps, um, but then you're also going back into sleep and then you're more likely to wake up again, kind of mid cycle perhaps. Um, and that's been associated with, with kind of feeling a little bit worse. Um, I've definitely experienced that as well. Um, in terms of sleeping longer kind of as a, as a topic and why you end up seeing this kind of U shaped curve in terms of people who sleep very little having bad outcomes and people who sleep too much having bad outcomes. It's not so much that oversleeping is itself bad for you. As far as I'm aware of uh, what they do find in terms of like big data studies um, is that people who end up sleeping a lot longer. So like maybe on average, like nine, 10, 11 hours um, is that there's comorbid underlying issues. So often with things like different health conditions or um, mental disorders that also affect this, this sleeping longer. Yeah, I find that interesting because in fact, I do not use an alarm and my natural wake up time is something between 5.30, 6am. So I suppose fairly early, but sometimes it does happen, especially during the weekends that, yeah, I just stay in bed for some time and then fall asleep again. And then as little as 20, 30 minutes, even if it's like sometimes even an hour do make quite a difference. So that is definitely interesting. Thank you very much for that, Olivia. And a little earlier, we already talked a little bit about the cognitive capabilities in regard to sleep. So we talked about sleep deprivation. Now we just heard, okay, one can also sleep too much. And you are also an expert on the cognitive capabilities and the effect of sleep on such. What is it that comes to mind if we talk about cognitive capabilities and sleep? How closely are they connected? Very, 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 very closely. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is something like reaction time, which is kind of in this in-between between, between uh, cognition and this physical response. Um, but that's why I think it's a great example. Um, so being sleep deprived, I think that if you're sleep deprived for 24 hours, you're as incapable of driving as someone who's legally drunk, uh, which you know, that half a second reaction time difference that you might see between someone who is sleep deprived and someone who's normally or well slept, um, that half a second difference, it could be the difference between a, a car accident and um, not having a car accident. Also for people that have to respond very quickly, such as like doctors that might be on call, uh, the military, other people where reaction time um, is very, very important. Um, so that jumps out right away. In terms of, I mean, we've seen in different studies, a host of cognitive abilities that are impacted by sleep deprivation, um, including like creativity, problem solving, um, memory, memory is a big one. Um, so those are just to name a few of things that they've seen in studies have been impacted by sleep deprivation. So creativity, problem solving, memory and reaction time first and foremost. And I don't know if there is data that we can talk to that, but is sleep deprivation or does it have the same impact on younger people as it has on older people? Or does it change by the person sleeping too little in this case and their age? That's a really good question. I think there's this i so we have seen that older adults sleep a little bit less than younger adults um and that's likely because of difficulty with falling asleep 
uh, waking up very early, you do see this shift in chronotype as people age. Um, I think in terms of experiencing an effect, I think that it might be people who might be accustomed to sleeping a little bit less will probably be more okay if they're like acutely deprived of sleep um, for a, an occasion or two here and there. Um, but I'm not sure of the effect um, on that on age. And you said that you could kind of get used to it. So let's say, let's use myself as an example. A few years back when I was still working full time as a management consultant, I certainly did not sleep eight hours. I rather slept six hours on average or so, which is like the lower end you said. Will it still have an impact on my reaction time, creativity, problem solving, memory and so forth? I believe it does over time for sure. But can you get used kind of to a low sleep or a low amount sleep environment? And should you or should you not? I think when people think like that, um, it's a, it's comes across to me as a little bit more like they get used to the feeling. Um, and so they think I'm fine because that's how they normally feel. However, I don't think that you should get used to. And I would like to give another example. And of course, I'm not going to put a name here, but I was working for a company and they had an executive. And to be fair, he was a fairly old school executive. And he said, if you need more than four hours of sleep, you will not be an executive in that very company. Now we said that probably old people need a little less sleep. But having said that, I mean, it was a global multinational company. And we talk about problem solving, we talk about memory, we talk about people who take impactful decisions. Is that something that we can or should be worried about if people in decision making positions sleep that little? And if our system asks us to work as much so that maybe the decisions we are taking at the top of those companies are in fact not the very best ones like what i think about most in terms of like decision making and like sleep deprivation is kind of like doctors um and i'm not really sure about how that uh i'm not really sure about how that shows up in kind of this uh, more corporate setting though and i think that some people do get used to it but i think that the effect on long-term your physical well-being is just not um worth it in the end and you're talking about doctors and there, I guess it also comes in with this reaction time, right? It's not only about memory, memory, you can maybe look at a pitch deck again, or like an, on, at an executive summary, but problem solving and especially combined with reaction time, if something is critical, maybe we can use the example of doctors. And it's just an assumption on my end, but I have a few friends who follow this career, let's say, they are also often very, very sleep deprived. So how do you think that plays back, let's say, into the medical system that we have? I mean, if many, I'm not saying all, but if many of our doctors are in fact not getting enough sleep, what does that mean to the medical service that we can offer to the people and society? Yeah, I think medical students and the military are like the best candidates for sleep deprivation studies uh, because it's so often required and kind of hailed as a, um, a you know, it's, it's kind of something that people have to go through uh, in order to be successful in the field. Um, and it's definitely a cause for concern. I think I would not want a surgeon who has slept four hours uh, to be performing, you know, to, to, to be inside of my bowels for, for whatever reason. Um, and I think there's movements to make it more transparent in terms of having doctors um, tell you how much they've slept um, or be able to request that kind of information because it just requires that kind of fine, that physical granularity. And then you want that mental acuity as well, which is going to be impacted by something like sleep deprivation. Absolutely. What I also found really interesting is your comment earlier on those 24 hours, and it basically can have an effect on your 
functionality, let's just call it, as if you would be legally drunk. And I don't know how it is in the US and the system or the medical system, but I am aware, I'm not an expert, but I am aware that in Europe, there is certain countries where you have initial shifts of 24 hours for doctors. So you deliberately working for 24 hours to then sleep a couple of hours. I don't know how long it is exactly. And I'm sure it differs from uh, position to position and from country to country, from hospital to hospital. But why would we then ask people to work for 24 hours straight? Maybe it's not hard physical work, but I mean, if you give a surgery, sometimes for many hours, it in fact is. Do you have any idea how that works in the US? And is there a trend to change something about it or... I'm not sure about trends. I do have a couple of people in my network that are also kind of on that career path. And I think what I've seen is, is like back to back, like 12 or 16 hour shifts, which just seems um, exhausting. I'm sure that there are reasons as to like why the system is set up that way. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. No, sometimes, and that's, perfectly fine that we agree not to really know and not to really understand. I think that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much anyways for your experience sharing here. And maybe another question on the sleep that could be interesting for me is, okay, let's say we work for 16, for 18, for long hours. How fast or how quickly can a body make up for such? Is it then one long period of sleep and the next day or two days later we should be fine or does it come back to what you said like you should have this yeah consistency of sleep rather so it really does not help to work 16 hours sleep 16 hours work 16 hours sleep 16 hours and so forth definitely i think that um, the longer you go without sleep so if you're working really long shifts um and you're not getting the eight hours that you need a day, the longer you'll have to overcompensate for that loss. The person that I've worked with in the field, a supervisor that I've had in this field, used to kind of say that you can never make up for lost sleep. There are certain things that you can do in terms of perhaps if I know I'm going to be sleep deprived tomorrow, I can sleep a lot tonight. Um, so that will mitigate the effect of sleep deprivation. There's something to be said for that. But sleep that you've lost, you never quite can really get back. Um, now, that sounds very scary. Um, and you can always kind of try to you know, let yourself sleep a little bit later and a little bit in in the following days. And I mean, a lot of people do that on the weekend, though I would not want to get back in the habit, to be honest, uh, get back in the habit of depriving myself during the week and sleeping longer on the weekends for that same um, idea of consistency. Which are here is something that you have been doing yourself for some time. The consistency? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I definitely try to. Um, and, and there's... A lot of there's I, I do use two different wearables um, to track my sleep. Um, and so it actually one of them is, is quite good in terms of telling me when I go to sleep on average. Um, and it has this very cool map of like all of the times I've gone to sleep in the past three months wearing it. Um, and it shows me like when I'm typically uh, going to sleep and, and when I should really aim to go to sleep based on some of my own data. So I think that there's a lot of there are a lot of developments right now in terms of like wearables and how we can use that information to gain insights um, and to make better health decisions. So, I, yeah, but consistency is key. It's actually, I have a follow up question. I don't know if you have personal experience or again, data on that. But there is also a lot of people who say one must not or at least should not have a phone or any other digital devices in the room that you are sleeping. Is that something that you also enforce for yourself? Or do you have any yeah, personal experience on that? That's something that I've definitely heard a lot, um, just like not in the room, uh, clocks in the room as well, I've heard, uh, so that you don't get anxious and you're not watching the clock in terms of, oh, I'm, I've now been awake for 30 or 40 minutes. That can cause some people a bit of anxiety, um, understandably. So I've heard like trying to remove electronics and clocks in the room 
I pers- like that just is not quite feasible for me. And I think for some people that that like work from home and so they, there's different kinds of objects in the room. Um, I do always uh, turn my phone upside down. I think that I have my phone upside down so that there's no screen facing up so that if I did get a notification during the night, um, then there isn't like a light flashing because I do kind of believe that even something as subtle as that could like disturb um, my sleep perhaps if I'm facing that way. I also make sure that my um, ringers are off um, on any devices that I that are in the room um, because I, I just don't want to be disturbed. I don't, we, we already have so many small disturbances in our sleep during the night that we don't even we don't even remember them. Uh, when we wake up, we can have upwards of 20 or 30, what they call micro disturbances or micro, you know, just doing anything I can to minimize, minimize that from, from a device. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much on that. And it's interesting, those micro disturbances, 20 to 30 disturbances could be per night. And what, what would be other examples of micro disturbances? Would that be a sound of a car or a truck passing by? Or is that, I don't know, warm or cold air? Or what are those micro disturbances that would be very interesting? Yeah, I think something like uh, a, a door opening um, or um, definitely a truck passing by or some kind of noise. Um, awaken uh, small awakenings like those micro awakenings are are pretty normal um so if you've noticed that you're you know if you hear something like that that's that shouldn't be a huge cause for concern of course if you're waking up and then you're stuck awake for uh five minutes 10 minutes 20 minutes that's a different issue um but these like very small kind of awakenings are pretty typical and and are usually just um in response to different things that are happening in the environment. I have one more question on the sleep, and I'm fully aware this, that this might be a dead end, but we talked about cognitive capabilities and deprivation and sleep. And I would be very interested if you have any information or if there is any information on the emotional capabilities and the relatedness to sleep. Absolutely. A couple people in the lab that I was working in um, specifically were, were interested in projects um, looking at the effect of sleep or lack thereof on emotional capabilities. For example, they released a paper that was showing that people who are deprived of sleep um, are much more anxious than individuals um, that are not sleep deprived. And this has to do with, um, in the paper, they showed that this has to do with the connectivity between certain brain regions. Um, so there's definitely something like that. Um, they also released a paper recently. I thought this was really interesting because they used big data on donating information. So how often and how much people are making donations. Um, and they found out, well, in the US, we have this um, uh, we have daylight savings time. So we jump forward an hour um, in the spring and we fall back an hour in the fall. So there's that week kind of right when we lose an hour of sleep in the spring. And they show that people on a very large scale were cutting back on their donating behavior um, compared to the rest of the year, which I thought was really interesting. And so the, the paper that was just like kind of a supplementary piece of data um, in this paper that was looking at helping behavior. So kind of making the argument that when we're sleep deprived, we're not thinking about other people quite as much and we're less likely to partake in some kind of like helping um, empathizing behaviors. So there's definitely very strong evidence to show a, a strong connection um, between sleep and and the emotional brain. No, and certainly that kind of makes sense, right? So if you're sleep deprived, your system, the system of evolution that has trained us to take care of ourselves first then maybe is not as capable or not as open to think about others to think about the group which in correlation or which in fact has then again yeah like quite an effect if we would have a sleep deprived 
society or nation, what that means for helping other people. And what we, on the other hand, it's also quite an opportunity, I believe. So if we fix sleep, we can fix a lot of other stuff. So thank you very much for that, Olivia. One more thing is that um, there, for all kinds of like mental health issues, so anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, um, you don't see any of them that do not have any kind of effect on sleep. So sleep and these emotional issues are so intimately related that when you have an emotional issue, you're so much more predisposed to have issues with your sleep, um, either in quality or quantity. Mm, thank you very much. Okay. And before we change the topic from sleep a little bit, Olivia, maybe if we want to conclude a good night's sleep what can each and every listener of this podcast episode do and maybe you have three bullets maybe you have five but what is yeah a good structure that we can follow in order to get enough but not too much sleep i'm going to just highlight some of the points that we've already talked about which is um consistency as much as you can taking care of your sleep environment and trying to perhaps develop a routine that will best set you up for your brain to go to sleep in the evening. So I think those things are, are really important. And I think a lot of people know about them. Um, but I think before my attention was really drawn to my sleep hygiene and how important it is, I hadn't thought that much about implementing those things that I've heard. So hopefully this will just make people think a little bit, you know, more about, about caring about their sleep um, so that we can be all a little bit better slept. I'm sure it will. Thank you very much, Olivia. And that actually opens the door to another very dear topic of mine, and that is career pivots. And maybe before we talk about why and where to you changed your career or at least took different direction. Olivia, the first question that came to mind was you graduated at one of the top universities in the US. Was that always a given when you grew up? So did you know, okay, I'm going to go to this and that college? And did you know from the very beginning that this will happen? Or do you want to talk us through a little bit of your academic career leading there? Sure, I definitely in high school, I was very involved in academics. Um, I was taking some of the more advanced classes so that I could get college credits while I was in high school. Um, so I definitely had on mind that I was going to be pursuing some kind of career um, and, and post high school education. Um, I didn't have this school particularly in mind, um, though a lot of people from my high school did transfer uh, and did end up going to this college, um, which I'm a very proud alumni um, of Go Bears. But yeah, it, it, the plan, it didn't, nothing quite went according to plan, um, which um, I'm fine with. Okay. What was the plan and what did not go according to plan? Maybe you want to enlighten us on that a little bit. I think it starts with the fact that um, higher education in the United States can be incredibly expensive. Um, I, I mean, as other countries as well, but um, I had applied to and was accepted to and was intending to go to a school in New York City. Um, and then I looked at the price tag and I realized that I could not put my family and myself into that much debt, um, or I wasn't ready to do that at that time. Um, and so I ended up deciding to take a year off. And so I went and I did, which I know is it's much more common in other countries, but it's not so common in the US to, to take a gap year. Um, so I decided to go and I lived in Germany uh, for a year before returning back. And then I decided to go to a community college, even though I had been accepted to these other schools. I decided to go to a community college to kind of get some of those general requirements out of the way um, before transferring to the four-year institution where I ultimately graduated. Um, and I definitely really appreciated, um, there's a lot that I appreciate about going to the community college. I think that um, I had had this notion that 
people that go to community colleges are not as smart or they're not ready in like all, you know, any way or in any particular way to go to a four year. But I met a lot of really smart people. I got to save a ton of money by living at home and I commuted to my school. Um, I was able to work and I was with a lot of students, uh, like returning students um, that I might not have otherwise met. Thank you very much. So I hear that there was actually quite a good, quite a few good learnings from community college. And you also mentioned a gap year and that this is something rather uncommon in the the US. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about why did you decide to do a gap year and why did you decide to do it in Europe maybe also? I decided to do a gap year. It was kind of a last minute decision, to be honest with you. Um, It was, I had like three weeks or something to make my kind of final decision about where I was going to be next year. And I was looking at that price tag um, and ultimately decided that I wasn't ready to do that. So my mom, who is very well traveled herself, she lived in Thailand for three years in her 20s. She just advise that I think about what other things I might be able to do. And then I came across a way that would let me live in Germany for a year. Um, To be honest, I was first looking at the Netherlands because I have some family and some chosen family in the Netherlands. But I ended up finding a Dutch family in Germany um, that I got to live with for a year. Uh, So I got to kind of learn a more useful language, uh, but do some of the cultural things that were really important. important to to me um as part of that experience um and i yeah i just kind of wanted to have an adventure and and do something a little bit different and show myself that i you know am more capable than i think i am sometimes which is kind of a theme for me uh because sometimes i think that i'm not able to do something um so then i have to do it i have to try and give it my best shot so that was kind of the lead up to this gap year um and it ended up being quite quite a great adventure Hmm. i can imagine so what was so special or what are maybe good memories that come to mind if you think back of living with the dutch family in germany what was yeah special for you or what strikes you still something that strikes me is um so i went there And I had totally intended on learning German before I moved. Um, I ended up having like three different jobs the summer before I moved to save up some additional cash. So I did not end up doing that. So when I went to Germany, I didn't speak very much German and my host kids did not speak English. Um, And so what struck me as amazing was the kind of bond that we were still able to form despite this like pretty significant language barrier. Um, they had had another um, au pair that was from the United States that did not speak um, German as well. So I think like they were already primed to be very accepting and to be very flexible um, and to have patience uh, with me. But, you know, there's kid, the kids were wonderful and there was so much um that we were able to do and like learn from each other dis- despite not even having a common language. Um, then of course I did take the time while I was there to go to language school and learn German um, and kind of see how our relationship changed over the year I was there. Mm, wonderful. Do you every once in a while still go back or are you still in touch with the host family? I am. I went back um Actually, this summer, uh, and I saw my host family, they also visited me in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Um, And every year for my birthday, I get five birthday cards from them, one from each member of the family, and they all arrive at once. And it makes me smile every time. Oh, I can tell. Wonderful. That's super nice. And it seems like you created a very nice bond, even though maybe you did not have the same language. Are all five of those cards in German or are they in English? Or even in Dutch. They were they were in German before, and now they're more in English because the kids went to international schools, and so they've um, they're trilingual. They're growing up trilingual, which I think is just incredible. So yeah, and a, sometimes there was a little bit of Dutch thrown in there, but mostly in German and English. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Olivia. I think it opens a good perspective, and I do believe gap years really do help 
each and every individual to reflect and also to have a lot of fun and to experience a new world that you haven't seen before, right? So, I mean, I grew up on different continents myself, but also just after high school, I went to India to work for an NGO there for one full year. And I think that also broadened my horizon. It was partially going back to the very area where I grew up. So it still is a little bit of a different topic, but I can only encourage each and everybody to take gap years often and yeah, openly. I think it's a very nice idea. And maybe we can circle back a little bit to your academic career and to this pivot maybe and Olivia you had for my understanding and you may correct me here but you had a PhD prospect with one of the most prestigious universities in the US and you worked we worked kind of with the titans of sleep I just want to call it and you clearly have a lot of expertise and you clearly have a lot of interest in it but you decided that you want to pivot your career and I would be very interested why did you take a decision not to continue this path and how did you do so I think very much about like the explore versus exploit balance so of course like you should explore um I'm still very I'm still I'm only 25 I'm um at the very beginning of my career. I only graduated a few years ago. So I'm thinking about being in this exploration phase. Um, I do still have a lot of interest in sleep. And so there's that exploit side of like pursuing that even further. And so trying to find that balance between um, right now, while I have a lot of energy, while I'm in this phase of, of just like wanting to meet a lot of different people and expose myself to a lot of different paths um, and also pursue the things that I do find interesting um, or the skills that I want to develop at the same time. Um, an interview question that comes up so often is where do you want to be in three to five years? And I just, I don't know. Uh, I think the better question is like, what skills do I want to develop right now? Um, and how might that you know, that's going to help me shape my path. Um, and I know for some people, you know, seeing three to five years in advance, they have very clear visions um, and more power to them. Uh, I have a lot of respect for that. And, and that's why people sign up for, for PhD programs um, in the first place. Um, in my experience, um, I took a job in a lab, um, in a sleep lab, because I wanted to get more experience and, and see from the inside what doing a PhD program um, might look like. Um, what does that look like on a day to day? It's one thing to like go to student panels and it's one thing to like, you know, have lab work as an undergrad while you're taking all of these different kinds of classes. But I wanted to know what it was like um, before signing my next five, six, seven years away to a particular university, to a particular field, to a particular PI. Um, which is a principal investigator or the professor that runs a lab. Um, so I wanted to, to have that experience. Um, and I learned so much. <laughs> I, I learned so much from being in that position of, uh, I was a lab manager, so I was staff, but I was also running studies. I was taking part in analyses. I was attending lab meetings with, with um, true scholars. Um, which was, a, I mean, an incredible experience. Um, and I think in terms of skills, like I'm much more like quantitatively uh, focused than I was a couple of years ago and I have more capabilities there. Um, but I did realize like, okay, like I don't know if this is for me right now. Um, I think that graduate school is perhaps still on the table sometime in the future. Um, but for right now, um, I decided like, okay, I, I've tr I tried this. I really enjoyed a lot of it, but I realized there were a couple of things that didn't feel like the, you know, the fit that I was looking for. And so I'm going to just, I'm turning and I'm exploring elsewhere. Um, but of course, I would love to use my, my knowledge of sleep um, and my interest in it, like as fuel, um, or if it provides a really great segue into my next career turn you know my next field um then that would be great as well 
Mm, no, wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I would like to detail this exploration phase a little bit. But before we do that, and without wanting to make this an interview, a job interview, but what are the skills that you actually want to develop, Olivia? Uh, I definitely want to work on my quantitative skills. I think just we're in this world of like data um, and coding, and I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is just such a hot spot for, for all of that. And so it feels very important um, and empowering to have those kinds of skills. Um, another top skill that I've been wanting to work on is speaking. So that was you know, part of the reason I was interested in doing this with you is kind of um, a really good practice in talking about things that I'm uh, interested in, like other topics, as well as my own experiences. Um, I, th I think facilitation, like facilitating collaboration, um, it seems like like kind of subtle in a sense, but I think I've, I've watched a lot of facilitation, especially recently. Um, in my one of my more recent uh, job um, job experiences, um, but I think that there is a real art between a, a real art of facilitating conversation and like gaining insight, which is something that you must know quite a bit about. Um, I think those are some some top skills. So quantitative thinking, or yeah, quantitative skills, uh, speaking, and facilitation. Okay, wonderful. No, and I think all of them are definitely very important and good skills to have. And I would be interested, I don't know if you have such a thing, but in the process of how do you reach this conclusion that you want to work on those three skills? Do you start with a sheet of paper and sit down every 3rd of January after New Year's and say, okay, this is what I want to learn? Or do you sit down after you have certain emotions? Is there anything, any structure that you follow that we can share with the audience that you know, okay, I might not have this five or 10 year outlook, which is, I suppose, perfectly fine. I think this is something that's changing for our generations anyways. But is there some kind of structure or approach that you use in order to figure out what are the skills that you want to develop next? I think it's been a much more organic process for myself. However, one thing that I think I'm trying to tune um, into more intentionally is looking at the people that I admire around me. So the, usually it's like colleagues or supervisors, uh, people who are very um, well known in their fields um, that I've gotten the chance to work with a little bit more closely. Um, and just seeing, like trying to really observe what it is they're doing and how they're doing it so that I can try to like emulate that. And so I've worked with a couple of people who have extraordinary quantitative skills, uh, data visualization skills. Um, and that's something that I would love to have in my toolkit. Um, in my more recent job experiences, I'm working with people that are doing a lot of speaking and just making it seem so natural um, and so effortless in a sense is incredibly effortful. Um, and so just, I think, observing the people around me and, and, and trying to just like pay attention to what they're doing. And, and when I get the chance to ask the questions that I really want answers to um, with the people that are very successful and what they're doing is, is I think exactly what I should be doing at this stage in my career. <laughs> No, absolutely. And I think this exploration and also an organic exploration helps a whole lot, right? So now you have those three and you develop and probably a fourth or a fifth one will arise and then you just go down this route. And you said earlier that maybe a PhD still be on the table, but do you have something in your mind that you say, okay, I want to follow a career at least a year, at least five years, at least n number you may state here, or how do you choose opportunities to explore? I would be interested in. Definitely. And I want to, while I'm still in this exploration phase, I definitely I'm, I'm not looking to like just necessarily hop from thing to thing in the next like couple of years. Um, I, I want to give something a, a real good, honest uh, try and, and give it my best. And, and a huge part of that 
is choosing very carefully the opportunities that I want to take part in so that I, okay, I'm going to do this for the next two, three years. Um, and we'll see what happens. Um, in terms of choosing those opportunities, I think one thing that I've realized in the recent years is just how important your network is. Um, and I did not think about that as much in college as I maybe should have. Uh, but now I just see how important it is um, to like expand your network and go to different kinds of activities and meet people who are um, who are experts in things that are very different from the things you are an expert in. Um, so expanding the network, um, finding a place where I can try to grow those skills that I'm that I've found consciously. So it's kind of a feedback loop in terms of like meeting people that you want to get skills from and then trying to like work in like a space where you can develop those skills with people who are good at them. Um, I think that's a huge thing. Um, and I think as well, um, like I definitely am also trying to use my natural skill set, like the things that I find come a little bit easier to me. For example, um, I've, I'm, I'm very like a very organized person and I have enjoyed like leading different kinds of teams when I've had the opportunity to do so. So trying to like also find a place where I can um, help be a part of a team or be a, um, a, a leader of a team in a small sense. Um, so I can use my, the skills that I have, the skills that I want to have. Um, and I would love to work with people who are who are excellent at what they do. Another potential dead end, but have you done a Gallup strength assessment? I've done the Clifton strengths test, the Clifton strength. Well, I, yeah, I think my top five are like harmony, discipline, you know, some, something kind of like that. And it, it made a lot of sense. So I think, yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting and trying to like put that somehow into like a cover, like highlight those things like in my resume as much as I can. I think um, that I found use and, and also just conceptualizing my strengths. You talked about quantitative skills, talking um, and presenting and facilitation. And you also talked a whole lot about network. And when looking at your current position, also a question that came to mind is how important is your impact and community work in the activities that you currently do for yourself? It's definitely important. I think that was maybe a piece that was missing a little bit for me in academia was it felt very, the, the impact that I was having felt very distant from the work that I was doing um, day to day. Um, and it's very, very important and it does have an impact down the line. But um, I think I was also now looking to find a way to feel that impact and like be a little bit more, have a direct part in it. So in my current position, um, it's a program evaluation firm. And so what they do is they'll, they do, they have a couple of different um, capabilities. And so they'll do program evaluations, um, which is, for example, let's say a program on the community level is saying, OK, this after school program is going to increase math scores for fifth graders at this school in two years. So someone needs to go in and analyze that data, the pre and the post, doing different kinds of assessments to actually evaluate that kind of impact, um, which is super important in, in terms of dedicating resources, um, uh, allocating funding, um, all kinds of different things like, yeah, applying for funding, which is just more and more important as um, there are so many different programs out there competing for resources that you can't just have anecdotes anymore. You can't just say like, have a story from the people that you've impacted. Those are super important and beautiful, but um, it's also really important to have the numbers to back that up. And so this, the firm that I'm a part of, they do program evaluation. They'll also do community health needs assessments. So the non nonprofit hospitals in the United States are required to have these assessments done every three years where they get all kinds of imp um, feedback and input from members of the community 
to assess, okay, what are the top needs? What are the things that like perhaps the hospital can help address in the community that are most important? Um, there are so many different things that come to mind in terms of different types of needs. Um, it could be uh, accessibility to healthcare. It can be housing. Um, it can be behavioral health. It can be, you know, needing more green spaces to recreate uh, safely. Um, I mean, there's so much that falls under the umbrella of community health. And so it's like, where does, you know, with all of these things, where does, how do people prioritize? Um, so they'll do all of these assessments and gather data from the community to assess exactly where the priorities are um, so that the nonprofit hospitals or other kinds of bodies um, can um, prioritize and, and make the biggest impact. No, super interesting. And actually something that I am very interested when you talk about that is how can you or how would you compare data on all that you just discussed, but for different districts or even for different states or for very different environments? Maybe this is a little bit too much for our podcast episode, but I would be very interested maybe now, maybe in a year, maybe in five years to talk to you and to understand, okay, the scheme or this particular policy works in that very district and it does not work or therefore it does work in a very different district as well. Do you already know how you compare between different districts? Of course, you try to find similarities, I suppose, but how do you also value differences and test? Is that something that you also have any information already about or not yet? Yes. Um, kind of thinking about in the U.S. we have counties, um, which, you know, essentially comprise different cities and, and um, districts, I suppose. Um, and what I have seen is that mostly people in these assessments, they'll look at the county level or they'll look at like a, 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 even a subsection of the county. Um, and then they'll compare that to the state and they'll compare that to the U.S. at large. They will sometimes do comparisons between like adjacent counties, uh, but you run into certain kinds of built in differences, which is, I think, kind of what you're getting to. Um, for example, I was looking at one county's data and they're much more rural. They're much more one of the biggest issues I was seeing in their data was access to healthcare because people were having a hard time even getting to the hospital. It was so far like getting to specialist services, um, like that was a significant issue. Um, the cost of transportation. Whereas if you're living in the in the middle of a city, you may not face that same problem. It may be that, you know, one an, in a different county, um, I was seeing that there were much there were many more difficulties for the unsheltered and unhoused population. Um, and they were having difficulties getting access to care. Um, and so all of these problems kind of exist um, in all communities that I've seen. So that's why prioritizing it from people in that area is just such a crucial part of the process because otherwise you might, you know, try to address access in an issue where the access is actually more okay. And it's more about, um, or more specifically access to behavioral health, or it's like they need more education on diabetes and how to, um, you know, think about nutrition. Um, so it, there's definitely differences and it is mostly useful to look at it in like adjacent counties or like places that are closer to each other or comparing it to those state and national benchmarks. Okay, wonderful. No, it sounds very interesting. It sounds like you explored a very big and interesting area to work and to exploit. So I'm very curious hearing from you down the road, how you like it and what you actually focused on a little 
bit more. And with that, Olivia, there is a few questions that I ask each and every of my podcast guests at the end of an episode. But before we go there, is there anything in regard to sleep, in regard to the academic system, in regard to areas to explore and in regard to something that we haven't talked about that you deem we have not spent enough or sufficient time on today and that you would like to share with the audience? I think one thing that I've been thinking a lot more consciously about and making a more conscious effort in in the recent couple of months um, is exposure to things that are different. Um, and, and I think that goes for the types of books that I'm choosing to read, um, that goes for the people that I'm trying to meet, the, the meetings that I'm trying to attend. Um, there's so much virtually now. Um, and so I would say go to Eventbrite, go to, you know, wherever you find events, uh, but you can look at the global community because you can attend those events from the comfort of your own room. Um, because even at that like introductory level, I think it, it's a, it provides a good place to like build more questions um, and to just think about different types of topics and like make those um make those connections in your own mind, which I think will only serve you. And I think that also applies to exploring what your options are. A lot of people are, there's a big trend towards like the great resignation in the US. A lot of people are doing career transitions. So I would just say just right on that trend to try looking at what it is you enjoy, what skills you want to develop, and some of the stuff that we we did talk about. So I think that's my piece of advice. Wonderful. Broaden your horizon. I love that, Olivia. Thank you very much. And you just mentioned read different books. Is there any books that either you like to gift a lot or that have left an impact over the, let's say, I don't know how avid of a reader you are, the one last one or two years? I think... One book that I really enjoyed recently was Educated by Tara Westover. It is a memoir um, about um, a girl's kind of getting, she, she grew up in a survivalist family um, in the United States and then kind of entered the world and became educated in her journey there, which I thought was really great. I also read Atomic Habits by James Clear, which I think a lot of people who are into um kind of personal development, professional development is, is a very good read with a lot of good nuggets of wisdom. Um, and I think uh, All About Love by Bell Hooks. I thought that was a really beautiful one as well um, because I think it gave me a, some different definitions or some different ways of conceptualizing love that I had not thought about before. So I thought that was a really good one. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing that. And Atomic Habits, of course, I have also read. All About Love, I have also read. But The Educated, I'm going to put on my reading list. So thank you very much for sharing that. And thank you very much also yeah, in the name of the audience for three excellent book tips. And that, Olivia, leads me to my three final questions questions of today's podcast episode and the first one would be what motivated or influenced you over the past week hmm that's a really good question um something that motivated me because I did in this last week I tried something new and I, I needed to do something new and so I think something that motivated me was just wanting to give whatever it, you know, what I was doing, my very best shot. Um, so that, you know, no matter the outcome, there was a chance that there's always the chance that things don't go the way that you hope that they go. But I wanted to look back and say um, that I gave it my very best shot. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you very much for sharing that, Olivia. And the second of the three question would be, who are your mentors or whom do you look up to? Um, I'm going to say a couple of the people that I've worked with very closely. So one of them, um, he's a sleep scientist um, at the University of California, Berkeley. His name is Rafael Vela. 
uh, he's French, he's a French scientist um, and his quantitative skills, he's just an, an all around amazing person um, and his quantitative skills are fantastic. Um, another is a professional mentor of mine that I've known for several years. Um, and she's the one that has kind of opened these doors of community health to me. Um, and so she's been amazing. I think that's, that's what I have for now. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Olivia, for sharing that. And the third and last question is a rather hypothetical one. And I call it the three truths. So, Olivia, I would like you to imagine that you are traveling all by yourself in space, actually for quite some time. So this could be a couple of months or this could even be a couple of years. And after all that solo travel, you encounter a human-like species. And they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What do you tell them? That's such a good question. Um, I would tell them, I think one thing, one fact is that humans usually enjoy novelty in terms of and on that, I think like we really enjoy on a, gen you know, on a general level, uh, trying new things um, and finding new ways to just like observing new things. So I'd say novelty. Um, I think another truth would be that we often take part in community. And a fourth thing would be we're still figuring a lot about ourselves, <laughs> figuring a lot about out about ourselves. Wonderful. So we have normal novelty, we have community and we have learning. Self-discovery. Yeah. Self-discovery. I love that. Thank you very much, Olivia, also for being an expert and being a guest on the Just Another Mindset podcast. And if there's any last words for today's episode, it's all yours. I just want to say thank you for, for having me and just for your amazing preparation. And um, it's been a pleasure. If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.